On this video, let's talk about self-soothing, both how to do it and the challenges. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Alan Robarsh, an attachment-focused psychotherapist and a relationship educator. And I like to talk about how to heal attachment trauma and improve our relationships. And on this video, let's talk about self-soothing. Let's explore specifically what that means and name concrete action steps that you can apply to your self-directed healing work. Now, for my work with clients over the years, I have been developing and promoting a model of self-directed healing. At its core, it's about three things, listening to self-wisdom, leading with self-action, and choosing self-compassion. And all three of these combined working together equals loving yourself. So for today, we want to apply this model of self-directed healing work to the topic of self-soothing. Let me share with you the format of this video is to organize the content so that it covers three areas, the what it is, how it works, and then also naming some action steps. The goal is to help you integrate these ideas into your healing process. Now, if you like this video, please do all of the things, and I know you know what I'm talking about, the subscribe, click like, and also leave a comment. I know you have heard this 800 times, so please accept the 800 and first time. It really does help, so please complete those steps. Also, if you value this video and you receive benefit, please consider becoming a sustaining supporter. You can make a donation, you can join us in the membership community, improve your relationships, or you could also purchase one of my courses. Thank you in advance for your contribution. Now, for today, talking about self-soothing, let's explore what it is and perhaps maybe what it's not or what we might assume that it is. Let's put it into context of attachment trauma and what might be some of the limitations and the obstacles to making that happen. So many of us have an assumption that self-soothing would mean calming down. You know, that the, the goal is to feel relaxed and to feel calm. And sometimes that's very important and it could be a great tool and a skill to be able to calm oneself down. I'm also reminded in this moment that we think of self-soothing as like soothing a baby and we can then, that joins or links to the phrase, um, um, hush, hush, hush little child, you know, hushing a child means telling the child to, um, to be quiet. And so if a child's crying and the parent often is working to get the, 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 the I almost said clients, <laughs> to get the baby to stop crying and to not feel so upset. And yes, that's very, very important. And again, has already been stated, it's very important for us to do that for ourselves. But there's something interesting in that what we could be doing is actually pulling out of and avoiding our difficult feelings. So already this is very sophisticated type of work because we need to have sensitivity of when do we enter and join with the experience and when do we try to de-escalate the activation so that we do come more into a, a state of calm. So if many people have experienced uh, uh, challenges or limitations to this approach of, of needing to relax and calm because in the moment when you're triggered and your nervous system is activated and you're feeling anxiety or you're feeling panic, you're very upset and then you're trying to tell yourself, calm down, calm down, relax, that's going against the reality of what's actually happening. You do not feel calm. You are not relaxed. You are not calming down. Things are actually escalating. So right there, what I'm suggesting, self-soothing doesn't mean achieve calmness. It doesn't mean uh, achieve feeling relaxed. It means participate and show up for yourself with where you are at in the moment. So if you're upset, be upset. If you're feeling um, intense despair, feel intense despair. If you're feeling anxiety, feel anxiety. Now, I could understand at first he hearing that, that that doesn't sound very comforting. So again, there's this little, there's, a, there's an edginess here 
uh, regarding the word comfort. Are we trying, does self-soothing mean that we have to achieve comfort and feel good? Or does self-soothing mean that we can show up for ourselves and participate in a process of paying attention to what's happening right here, right now, because we don't have anyone else who's here to help us. It's just us and we are feeling these feelings and they're so upsetting. And self-soothing can come in the form of affirmation. We say, yes, I'm upset. Yes, this is horrible. Yes, I don't know what to do right now. No, it's not, it's not going away. I, I'm really feeling frightened. Yes, I hear that you're frightened. This is frightening. So what we're doing is we're providing relational responsiveness. Uh, maybe even if you're feeling empathy towards yourself, it's an emotional responsiveness. So this moves self-soothing away from achieving a goal and achieving an outcome of saying, you know, I want to de-escalate my, my, the intensity of this fear, as opposed to saying, I want to be in relationship with the fear. I want to be in relationship with myself. Now, I just have to repeat one or the other approach here is not better than the other. There are going to be times when you're in certain situations where you do need to de-escalate and come back into a state of calm equilibrium and you need a break from the intensity. That is a very helpful approach and you can discern when you need to do that. Now, it is also going to be very helpful for you to, to know when to use the skill of joining with. So self-soothing doesn't necessarily mean uh, de-escalate the feeling. It means join with the feeling. And there's a lot of affirmation that comes in with this. The, the way that I approach it is, is quite literally with the word yes, and I repeat back to myself what I'm noticing. Yes, your thoughts are so scrambled right now. Yes, you wish you had help right now. You don't have help. Yes, you are very upset right now. I know this is upsetting. So it, it, the repetition and the acknowledging reality as it is, does have the ability to help us feel it's the reality check. We're giving ourselves a reality check of what is actually happening. This in and of itself is comforting. I want to point out the complexity of self-soothing because it's taking what we would consider an intra-psychic approach of in the moment, I am the one who needs soothing and I am also the one who is soothing. So same thing for you. This is called dual awareness. The process is intra with an A, intra-psychic, and the way we're doing it, the mind's ability to hold dual awareness. We hold the awareness of the part of ourselves that's freaking out, and we also hold the awareness of the caregiver, the wisdom self, the friend, who is going to be offering some support. Now, the challenge is that we need some agility or mental dexterity to move back and forth between these two parts of ourselves. And for me personally, in my process, this happens very quickly. So I'm hurting and then I pull out in a split second and I have this observer self that can say, hey, I know you're hurting. I'm here for you. I'm really here for you. You're hurting, friend. And then I go back into the hurt and I can feel it's a, it's, it's a very subtle shift of I'm helpless. I am very upset. Um, I need help here. Um, this is scary. This is too much. And then I can, and then I, I pop back out of it. There's this, this uh, it's kind of fluid when it's like a dance, it's a back, or think of also like in an orchestra when instruments are communicating, you know, this, this is, these are the clarinets, then we have the flutes, then we have the cellos, then we come back to the clarinets. There's this back and forth, uh, this symphony of paying attention and listening and responding, and it's the echoing. 
So sometimes this is literally verbal. I can speak out loud or I can think in my head. So sometimes it's literally, I am so alone right now. This is a burden and this is scary. And then I'm able to very quickly come into observer self and say, I see you friend, life is hard and you're still struggling with this loneliness thing. And let's just exhale together. <sighs> I hate this place. I really hate being here. Yes, I know. I, I hate it for you. It is hard. You're still at, at your age, every, what you do, you're still learning, you're still practicing with these very hard feelings in life. I'm sorry. Well, now I'm angry. I'm just angry it doesn't go. I hear that you're angry. Of course, we want, want loneliness to shift. We want sadness to shift. We want anxiety to shift. Well, it's not shifting. So I hear your anger and let's do reality testing and know that this is what, that we're practicing our ability to stay present with this. And like I said earlier, joining with. So I was just trying to give you a little bit of a showing this kind of back and forth where I'm the part that's hurting and I'm also the part that is going to uh, attempt to, to provide some presence and some attention. When we are not so much focused on an outcome, we're not, you know, we're not demanding calm down. We're not demanding, well, feel more relaxed. But instead we're saying, I really want to show up here for you and accept you as you are. I really want to affirm and validate what you're feeling. This is hard. I'm here for you. That's in a relational approach. So I said earlier, this is an intrapsychic approach inside of ourselves. We're entering our inner world, our inner world of emotions. We're holding this dual awareness, but what we're really providing, when we say self-soothing, what we're offering is self-relationship. And again, that's what I was attempting to model here so many minutes ago of this back and forth of it's the very same thing if a friend showed up and you're sitting in the living room with a friend or you're sitting at a coffee shop and your friend your friend's looking at you and can tell that you are upset and something's going on and your friend just has that really kind loving look in their eyes and they it's, they, they say tell me what's going on please just please you know quit holding it back like something's going on with you and and you look upset so so please let me know let me in. So it's that invitation and it's that willingness to like be let in or it's the, um, the invitation is so affirming uh, to, to know that you're being welcomed in, your feelings are being welcomed. So you're doing that same thing for yourself. You're welcoming the feelings and then you're providing this deep listening and you also have to be willing to share to the part of yourself that's doing the deep listening. Now, if you get hung up, you get to a dead end where you can't think of something to say, or you're, you're just neutral. Number one, allow the neutral places and now allow the pause, allow the gap. You might just exhale. You might all of a sudden pop out of this and you're a bit distracted. Or if you're at a coffee shop, you're just, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to get an iced tea or I'm staring, I'm just staring out the window. We, we don't need it to always be, have an intensity about it. And we don't have to be heavy handed with it. It's the same thing. Think of with a child who is a bit reluctant to share and to speak. And quite honestly, this could be with an adult, but I'm thinking with a child, you just want to be um, maneuver with a, a mindful sensitivity. There's no reason to strong arm it or force the child to speak. Uh, the reason why I use the connection to child is this idea of these really tender parts of ourselves, the very sensitive parts of ourselves. And when it's trauma activation, as you know, it's oftentimes these, these younger parts of ourselves. So it's okay if when you begin this process, you're not noticing a lot of that back and forth flow or communication. You're having a hard time noticing the connection. Each time you just make a mental note of how the flow is or isn't going and you, you continue to stay present. And sometimes that requires a silence and a neutral and a rest and a pause. And you will notice over time that uh, the more that you practice this, 
the, you will see the ability to engage yourself and engage those parts of, the, of yourself that are reluctant to come forth or are so frightened that you even calling attention to them is overwhelming. Now, let me, this has been in a way a foundation to this video and talking, you know, sharing, move, leading into this next point, which I feel is a really important point of one reason why this is so hard and challenging. And when we are activated in trauma, and a lot of my work focuses on attachment trauma, but honestly, it could be you know, many or all kinds of trauma, is that when we are triggered and activated, a byproduct or result or symptom of trauma is to disconnect from resource. And what resource means is all those parts of ourselves that help us function that we rely on that are basically our strengths. So creativity, uh, intelligence, ability to problem solve, um, agency, which is the ability to take action, the use of our imagination, uh, creativity, um, which I think I, I might have just said that one. So resource gets blocked when we are triggered and activated in our trauma. And we know that we have certain parts of ourselves that might feel a little more evolved or mature or our older self. But when our trauma is linking and activated to an age regression, a younger part of ourselves, we find that we're disconnected from these higher functioning skills or higher order thinking skills that we didn't have when we were eight or nine or 10 or also when we're really activated in a fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response of trauma, that we are in survival mode and a number of our higher order functioning resources uh, get placed on hold when the brain is operating in survival mode. So this presents an incredible challenge because the, the premise, the idea is let's show up and give ourselves some soothing but all of a sudden you find the tools in your tool bag aren't there or you you know at one point you had a tool bag and now you you're just searching internally and there's not not only are there no tools there's no tool bag with tools in them and so you can feel very lost now the other challenge and that that's um thinking in terms of like not having the the being able to access or find your resource Another challenge with trauma, as I'm sure you know, if you began monitoring and observing, trauma impacts our sense of self. And trauma, be it at the time or over time, post the trauma experience, can have an impact on our development, our sense of self, to the point that when trauma is triggered, we feel fragmented. Fragmented means we feel this disconnect. We don't really feel like we're all put together and we're grasping at pulling in different parts of ourself. When we are a fragmented self, we are going to feel challenged and struggle to find that unifying feeling, the center grounded feeling uh, where we drop down into this is who I am. I have a sense of myself. I'm going to make some choices. I, the me, the me part of me. Uh, that need that that is going to um, uh, offer some support and help. When we are in a fragmented fragmented state of uh, of trauma, we are going to struggle to find that internal center. Another way of phrasing this, there's this concept called uh, internal locus of control. And we can compare this to the other way called, called the external locus of control. And these are you know, very fancy ideas, fancy words for, for an internal locus control is the knowledge and belief that I can do something. And when I do it, it will have an impact and outcome. It's a belief in my ability to have influence over my situation, my circumstance, and I can create some change. This internal locus of control idea is very closely linked to this idea of agency. Uh, agency is our ability to ask ourselves the question, what can I do? 
and then the ability to take action and to uh, direct our energy towards something that we want or that we don't want, and that we're clear about um, taking, having some intention and plan. So the internal locus control, the sense of agency can get shut down when we cannot locate our sense of self. So already you enter, you, th th this, this creates so many problems for us because we want to offer support, but we have now disconnected from our resources and we have now disconnected from the part of ourself, the, the, the me that is going to provide some support is I cannot even locate that. I'm feeling very scattered. I'm feeling like I'm blowing in the wind. I'm feeling fragmented. Now, for some of us, this also activates the category or the, sim the trauma symptom of dissociation. And we're going to feel numb. We're going to feel um, cut out of our body. We're going to feel, it's a, bit of a little, I didn't mean to use that word, it's a bit of a violent word, cut out of our body. Um, I guess for some of us, we feel like that. I meant it more in the sense that we feel f like we're floating out of our body. When we are in this dissociated state, when we are numb, this could also impact our cognitive thinking that we just feel blank. We just feel really like you, you just can't think. Uh, there's, there's, um, there's a kind of slow, dreamy quality. And so you're trying to uh, muster up some energy and agency uh, to provide yourself some comfort. You're just not able to access any of the energy. It's like there's this, uh, this, this cord that we need to plug into some energy source and the, the cord is just disconnected. So what do we do in this case? So much patience and compassion and love and gentleness and kindness. There's going to be a lot of waiting in this place and we very much can use the body and we can use breathing. And if we're feeling so incredibly limited in those moments, we do our best to remind ourselves to breathe, the inhale and the exhale. We can create very simple phrases. I have often, you write them down on a post-it note, write them on a, you know, put them in your phone, five or six phrases that are important to you. So for example, one for me is just the word yes. So when I'm very, um, ungrounded and scattered and I, and I don't have a lot of bandwidth to be able to offer self-soothing. I create a mantra and mantra in the sense of like an ongoing repetitious um, way of um, almost like chanting. And I just say the word yes. I go yes. And there will be a feeling. So like I will feel, I'll, I'll just pay, I'll just be aware of um, my sadness is really strong. I'm feeling despair. It is so sad. And then, I'll, and then the best I can do in self-soothing is I just say, yes, 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 yes. Another one for me that's important is the word I know. So I interchange that to the yes, I know. And I try to make the tone of my voice as comforting or affirming as I can. I know. I know, I know, oh yes, yes, I know, I know, mm hmm yes, yes. And then back to breathing, keep the breathing going. In addition to what I just shared, be it uh, using language, and I really recommend speaking out loud because there's a certain level of effort that it takes to speak out loud that is engaging your body. It's going to be engaging uh, some of your diaphragm and your breathing and your vocal cords. And just the act of doing that is going to create some engagement um, as opposed to continuing, continuing to implode into yourself. Now, something else that you can do, and I have to be careful of my microphone here so I don't make a bunch of noise, but you can tap yourself and I don't mean in regard to a protocol of tapping or there's a particular uh, bilateral stimulation protocol of tapping in EMDR, which is really wonderful and helpful. And I actually created a video about that in the past. In this moment, I'm meaning the most simplistic tapping 
of acknowledging that we're here. And um, sometimes I, I do it like a little, uh, a little aggressively. Like sometimes I'm like really like, you know, like tapping myself. Other times it's very, very soft and it's like one finger and it's back to the same language. Either I will literally say this out loud or sometimes it's just to myself it's like, yes, hi, I'm here. I know you're here. Oh, hello body, hello body. Hey body, you're floating away. Oh body, you're so upset. There's such a big energy. Oh body, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we're here, we're here. Now other times, like what comes up with clients in the middle of a process when this is happening and they find themselves like shutting down and we can at least name and say, well, I'm noticing a lump in my throat. I'm noticing some tension in my throat. I'm noticing clenching. Then I also instruct and we can experiment and I've experimented with this with myself is just touch that part of your body as well. It's like, hello, tension in my jaw. Hello, headache. Hello, quiet voice. Hello, stuck voice that can't even get out any words right now. Again, it's this, this tapping quality, quality that is kind of um, a, a nurturing, gentle nudging. And it's saying, you know, let's, let's move through the energy. Come on, body. Let's keep, stay with me, body. Stay with me. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Something else that you can do when you can name a particular feeling. And sometimes if you can't name a feeling, then you just pick one, you know, pick some of the, the top three or four big ones, you know, hello, hello, sadness, hello, loneliness, hello, despair, um, hello, fear, you know, um, you just again, write them down in advance uh, in the moment. You might not be able to think, you know, oh, remind myself to, to confront the feelings, but just check in with the sadness and say, hey, sadness, I'm here. I'm listening. I know, I know we're feeling really scattered right now. And the, this is tough. There's an intensity, the energy is so intense. And then you could ask the sadness, sadness, what do you, what do you need? I'm listening, sadness. What do you need? And sometimes you might get clarity in the idea of an image or the idea of, um, 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 words will come to mind. Um, other times it might, um, I mean, quite honestly, just recently, what was I, this is getting personal in this moment. I didn't realize I was going to do this. What did I do recently? Um, it was about trauma. It was, I just had this moment. I think th there was something specific I was exploring around a trauma response. And I think for the longest time I've ignored or denied that it is an, a trauma activation. And I've just been trying to be strong and get through it and be strong. You know, you, I'll be, you know, I've been, I've been downplaying how intense this is. And I had this moment, it was in the car and there happened to be the rear view mirror. So like, am I even looking at myself? I can see myself. And I, and I, for whatever reason, I don't know why I would not have done this sooner, but I wasn't ready to really feel the intensity of those feelings. And I look in the mirror, I'm looking at myself and I just say, well, I think this is trauma. It was the most simplistic affirmation. And then a big cathartic, um, you know, I did have this, this wave of tears and crying and, and some emotional release. And it wasn't premeditated, it wasn't planned, but it was through that affirmation of very simply saying, hey, th this is trauma. This, 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 this that you're feeling, the sadness, the intensity of the despair, you know, uh, the, this is the, the, the result of living with, with trauma, living with attachment trauma. And the moment that again, I was like the observer self, I was the one offering care. My ability to do that just created this um, great comfort of speaking the truth. And it was hearing the echo, hearing the words of that truth. And again, it was very, very simple. We're not surprised, you know, we're just, just looking at myself in the mirror and say, wow, this is trauma. And that, that showed up then as a moment of self-soothing because um, this, this uh, cathartic release of some, some crying activated in that moment. But then also I was, I was really, I surprised myself, I say, I did not know that that was living in me today. So um, this, this work can surprise you. So let's bring our, um, let's, let's bring the, the video to a close. I do have some notes here. I just want to like 
check over my notes real quick. Um, the how of how to self-soothe is what we're exploring and we want to affirm relating as it is. We want to participate with the present moment itself and we want to, to engage the experience. Uh, what do you notice right now? What do you notice right now? What's happening right now? Um, we can ask ourselves, what does this activation need or this feeling need? If it could speak, what it, would it say? And where do you notice it in your body? Sometimes that's just really helpful just to localize it and say, well, I'm noticing all. Um, there's been times when I'm in the middle of this and for 15 minutes, I'm not even breathing. I'm, I'm noticing um, it's like beyond a shallow breath. It's like I'd been holding my breath almost uh, to the point of lightheadedness. And it's like, wow, it's like um, it's the it's the frozen experience, the fight, flight or freeze response, the freeze um response shows up in my whole body where I'm constricted and I'm not even moving. Uh, so, so that to just come back to well, what's going on with my body, where do I notice this feeling, the part that needs soothing, where is it? Oh, it's in my diaphragm, it's in my chest, it's in my heart, I'm noticing it in my throat, etc. So how we check in, we can just name our senses. If you can't if you can't come up with clarity of where to focus, you can run through a system, name your senses. I'm just going to notice my breathing right now. I'm just going to notice what I hear. I'm just going to notice what I'm feeling. Um, and I don't necessarily mean emotional feelings. I just mean literal feelings. Like I'm noticing myself sitting on the chair. I'm noticing uh, gravity pushing down on me. And I'm noticing the tension in my shoulders um, as I pull my, as, as my fingers touch my thumb touches my forefingers. I'm just noticing that sensation. So that is really, really helpful to track and monitor what's going on in your body. We name feeling states. We could also talk about ages. We could uh, say, hey, I want to identify if I feel like I'm in a, a younger regressed age or, or, or state. And oh, my 11 year old is present. I'm really feeling younger. I'm feeling Wow, I remember these, I, I felt the same way when I was 11. So uh, self-soothing can include starting to name these different parts, name these different ages. And then we could um, sometimes just name memories of times when we felt soothed in the past, places that are comforting to us, uh, that in the moment, if we can't come up with something, um, I recall, I remember uh, growing up, there's a particular tree I used to climb. There was uh, a, a good friend of mine, my childhood friend, we would climb this tree. So in my mind, I see this really glorious oak tree that's very big and sturdy and majestic. And just just envisioning the tree in autumn and all the colorful leaves, there's something incredibly comforting to me. So when I bring in those images and bring in those memories, that in and of itself can either be jumpstart self-soothing and or in or allow in my body to feel soothed and i can remember how my body was relaxed when i was climbing that tree and i just breathe through it and i use that as a launching off place uh, to remind myself that that we can return and get back to that kind of uh, state of calm state of equilibrium state of having felt soothed i hope that this video is helpful to you. Let's create an ending for today and bring it to a close. I have two questions for you. I, I want to know what did you learn and also what is your takeaway? So please share your reflections in the comments below. I welcome reading your thoughts. Also, if you have benefited from this video and value my work, please consider becoming a sustaining supporter. You can check out the links in the description for more information. So thank you in advance for your support. And in closing, I do want to say a few words about why we do this work. Our attachment trauma keeps us disconnected in our relationships. And that often includes feeling disconnected from ourselves. And this disconnect is extremely painful and it sets us up to fail in our relationships. So the good news, what I want to leave you with here today, the good news is that healing attachment trauma is possible. We can learn to heal our deepest connections. And I also like to say our deepest disconnections. 
please take from this video some encouragement and know that there is hope. We do this work because relationships are important and because emotional connections matter. So thank you for watching. Now go out there and create loving relationships.